Welcome to Watching Silent Films Podcast, where we pick a, a film or a series of shorts to watch and talk about it. Uh, with me is my co-host, Lily. Hello, Lily. Hello, Yifong. What's going on? Greetings, greetings. Um, today we're going to complete um, the Buster Keaton uh, shorts collection. Basically, it's the shorts from 1920 and 1923-ish. That should encompass all of the shorts that he directed, uh, most of which is with uh, Ed Klein. But in general, it's the, the collection of shorts that he completed before he moved on to feature uh, direct, directing features. He's he's directing these and acting in them, but also he's also kind of working towards graduating from shorts into features. And by the time you get to features, I think uh, Three Ages and also um, Sherlock Jr., those are going to be the, the subsequent features. Uh, We'll also be talk, tackling to in the upcoming weeks, so that's what's coming down the pike. But today we're going to talk about four uh, remaining shorts in this uh, Kino collection, and it's uh, Daydreams, Electric House, The Balloon Balloonatic, uh, Love Nest, and that's the last four. So before we get there, um, just wanted to thank all the listeners. Um, I, we did get another email, follow up Woo-hoo! emails from uh just different people um i think it's the same person he he ended up uh adam the previous person who wrote in thanks us for addressing this question and so that's pretty cool it's also local to our area so i don't know if we're gonna be able to if there are silent film showings once the whole pandemic is over that would kind of organize some sort of a trip so if you're a local listener in the boston area okay it would be kind of cool i guess and thought about that but I guess there would be people from, you know, in the area listening. <laughs> mm. I just don't associate Boston with uh, silent films, maybe just because we don't have a film festival here. Whereas if you go to like, um, yeah, silent San film Francisco, fest- yeah, like any of the other larger, more, a little bit more artsy, I guess. I think the Boston just has more uh, very niche and localized stuff. They're not more on the. Uh, sort of national level i guess i don't know mm-hmm. it varies i mean y- you can debate it either way you can be like oh well boston has the, all this stuff and then some people are like boston doesn't have the, i don't know everybody has different opinions about that but anyway yeah, cause they, you're right though they have a ton of there's tons of film festivals that happen or at least that have happened Ugh, covid but uh i haven't actually looked up a silent film festival for our area i just know of a ton in new england there's at least you know a hundred i can name off but for silent film, I'm not sure. So that's actually it, good to yeah, look up to. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, there's um, like Boston Sci-Fi is very popular. Mm-hmm. A lot of uh, Japanese animation type. Um, what's that called? Like you play dress up. What do you call that? Oh, the cosplay yeah, conventions. Co- yeah, yeah, cosplay. So there's a lot of those. A lot of Comic Con type esque mm-hmm. conventions and organizations. So th- it's I, it's it is actually kind of diverse and very. It just it's just not this specifically diverse in terms of silent yeah. films you know so it's diverse but not diverse enough <laughs> so it always is <laughs> um yeah i don't know so maybe one of these days it'll happen um i'm just not aware myself of any uh best as i know so mm-hmm. anywho um before we get started uh, you, you, were you able to see anything in the classic realm yourself no i never watch anything besides what we're doing for the podcast i I was looking up a couple different ones to watch in case i decided to do another solo adventure with the podcast so i was like hmm because when i was looking up the electric house information it had a slew of a whole bunch of other silent films and i was like oh okay what are all of these so i can go back to them and check them out we could also do that for the shorts as well Ooh. Like, I mean, we can talk this, talk about this afterwards, but <laughs> I think one of the things, um, just, kinda, I, I guess, you know, even for the listener to know, we're kind of playing with the format. So we potentially could, you know, select a, so Buster himself, Keaton has, has made, um, another, I don't know, 10, 15, I don't know how many, I, don't, I didn't, I hadn't looked it up, um, before this, but it, it's something like, you know, more than 10, more than 15, maybe series of shorts with um fatty arbuckle that's where he started his career from 1917 all the way to 1919 before he he took on sort of directing his own stuff so there's a you know there's a whole another sort of chapter in his career uh between volleyball days uh, you know when he stopped doing that and not stopped but he um kind pursued of, other outlets in a sense 
Yeah, he he started doing you know silent films, and he uh, he was kind of you know an apprentice, where uh, Fatty Albert was kind of his mentor. So I feel like that's a, a good candidate for something like that, something short, you know, or hmm. something like that. I don't know. Just food for thought. There are also a lot of if you just t- uh, go to YouTube and Google the uh, silent horror. There's probably a ton too that are short too. Hmm. I know there's a uh, Frankenstein 1910. So that was pretty. I, I saw some blips about that from some other silent film uh, Facebook group somewhere. That's pretty cool. It was thought to be lost, and they found it recently. Ooh. Like many silent films. But anywho, yeah, I uh, had a chance myself, except I did uh, start to kind of uh, sort of watch ahead a little bit for Sherlock Jr. and also uh, Three Ages. Those are pretty nifty. I mean, we'll dive into details when we get there. (laughs) Hmm. But um, I'm going to also try to kind of watch ahead a little bit more and then try to scope out what we can sort of line up to in the future. But we can talk about that later. In the meantime, let's uh, just get started in the the main feature, which is the Buster Shorts. Um, the first one is Daydreams, nineteen twenty two, and um, this one is about uh, Buster trying to marry a girl, but the father disapproves, so he vows to go to city and get a job or commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very much uh, in line with everything that's happened before in terms of the comedy shorts. Very, very much, um, you know, extremes, right? It's, that's mm-hmm. kind of the nature of slapstick and stuff like that. So what's interesting is that uh, he, he's, uh, he, and this is either around the time or after the whole uh, Arbuckle and scandal, right? The, the, you yeah. Know, the, 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 the whole hoopla about that. And after that, uh, uh, because he's such an influential um, mentor in uh, Buster's life, he actually uh, got uh, Roscoe to either direct in some of these shorts and or features, uh, as well as write contribute something towards these series of things. Oh, that's good. But he can't really like. He, he can't he, reveal it because then yeah, it'll get because he's some type of backlash. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So he's blacklisted. He's, he's, he has to work on pseudonyms and stuff like that. And so I mean, the fact that Buster did that was kind of a risk to himself. If, you know, it was kind of blown, it was, if the media got a hold of it and actually figured out what's going on back then, and maybe they did, I, I'm not sure, I didn't really get into that. I think in some of the shorts and uh, some of the features, they did actually uh, do some exposés about that. So, but, hmm. you know, in the long run, I don't think Buster was tarnished, uh, at least at that point in time. His no, it reputation. didn't seem like it. Yeah. But anyway, so that's what the the plot of this film is. Uh, the character Buster plays wants to marry someone, but the father disapproves. So he ends up going to the city and takes a series of jobs, and he writes back to this girl. But you know, in the girl's imagination, <laughs> yeah, she's thinking that he's <laughs> doing certain things that are better than is actually appearing because he's the way he's writing is kind of not uh, uh, spelling it out. It's, it's very glamorous. The exactly. idea, <laughs> and then he makes his way back, and that's pretty much. It. And by the way, the the girls and the hilarity ensues. That's always going to end this. <laughs> but mm-hmm. he, the girl's father is Joe Keaton, right? Because he he keeps. Casting yeah, I thought him. I recognized him. Yeah. Yeah, keeps casting him back on, which is kind of cool. Like I, 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 you know, I never read any biographies and stuff about Bus. I mean, I don't know the details of how his relationship is with his dad, but it seems mm-hmm. like if the fact that he's hiring him to to be on his film seems like they're okay yeah i would hope so otherwise yeah, they, he wouldn't hire him <laughs> yeah they didn't have a falling out or anything like that so i felt like that was kind of cool um mm. i think it was it's gotta be i think the electric house the next one where he gives him a kick in his butt and then oh uh, yeah so that's apparently a very popular the keaton three when they were growing up in the volleyville days it's like a hearkening back to that and they're like trying to do that in the film so that's pretty cool mm-hmm. so like on the stage he'd do that all the time the, f- the famous you know kick to uh the rear end and he does this whole spill right mm-hmm. so that's that was like one of those shticks that they uh have a routine that they have that brought from the stage which 
most of these, if they're vaudeville, they, they would have brought many, many routines from those days. The gags, you know. Right. That so makes sense. Cool. So what did you think of this one? Um, I was actually interested in the, how there was a lot of clips missing from it. Yes. But the, the version I watched uh, was actually listening to one track on YouTube while another one played because it was clearer. So it I don't know, these two different YouTube videos. So I was watching two technically. Right. One had missing clips but was blurrier, and the other one was completely Where, silent. Are you and watching then, these on Canopy, or did you search them out through YouTube? That one I actually just watched on YouTube at I the see. time. I okay. shouldn't have had. <laughs> That's all right. I know. Oop, my secret's out. But uh, on for that specific movie, I was watching it through YouTube. So, I I mean, it was, yeah, it was missing clips, and it was interesting to see the photos that accompanied it. So, it just seemed to be mostly when the girl was daydreaming about what he might be doing. Like, oh, he's a surgeon now. And, oh, he's this wealthy Wall Street banker. Look at his top cat, his top hat and cane. <laughs> but then reality, when he's working on Wall Street, he's a garbage man. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, there's they're all that's the gag is that, you know, you write back and, and write in something nice like, you know, I'm moving up in the world and he's just mm-hmm. you know in the office is cleaning as a janitor or you know I'm, I'm in a hospital taking care of and then you know her, her daydream is like he's like a you know famous world famous surgeon in in uh you know yar ER hospitals in fact he's just uh, taking care of animals in a, in a very yeah because <laughs> avon wrote down one of the intertitle cards for the wall street one i'm now on wall street where i've been cleaning up in a big city you know just like oh he's making himself <laughs> exactly. seem big yeah. and impressive or I like, you know what <laughs> i like his um it's very witty i like his yeah i like his written intertitles i of all the comedies that i've seen uh, i mean maybe they do i you know it's been so long I, I can't remember now but i feel like he's pretty witty in terms of mm-hmm. his um written written you know comedy not even just performed comedy, you know? Yeah, definitely in some of these, you you get, you know, get a flavor of, like, what his writing style was like as, like as well. Because, you know, he's, you know, doing all these films. He's got to have a hand somewhere with that creativity. I do wonder if he... So he did do a lot of... Uh, he helped with the, the Marx Brothers later on during the talkies era hmm. with a lot of their sort of uh, funny stuff. And But um, in, in terms of gags, I wonder if they he, he added some dialogue to them as well since he's pretty witty so i don't know maybe he didn't possibly he didn't. i mean it's yeah ha- you never know to... makes sense i haven't read any details i don't know sure i'm just thinking out loud <laughs> conjecture <laughs> here i did notice that um you remember back in the general right it, well, first thing i i remember recalling or maybe noticing again is just that when a character starts to utter something and it needs to be a dialogue that's written for intertitle Mm-hmm. The moment the character opens their mouth is the moment it cuts into dialogue. You notice that sometimes? I think I have. I can't think of any right off the top of my head now, but I definitely have noticed that. Well, that was happening in the general, but I was talking about these. Yeah. I mean, I didn't mm-hmm. realize how he was doing that as as early as these shorts. I thought he was kind of figuring that out sort of um, in in the feature films more, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. But even in the shorts, he'll, he'll like, uh, kind of not always, but sometimes it'll just happen, you know. So I, mm. I thought that was kind of cool that in these experiments, he was already kind of going there. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there are so many elements and pieces. In fact, there are many gags that he would repeat in the feature films, too. Just as he would, re- he had has repeat repeated gags from Volleville days. Mm-hmm. The stuff he's developing for these shorts, he'll kind of pull back over and over again i mean just like the whole notion of the cop stuff yeah the cop stuff is which great. Would, like <laughs> which you you've seen before even from other comedians and then he would yeah. you know kind of bring it to a full sort of full but you pull out the full stops with that short cops but then after with that you, you constantly kind of go back to that right mm-hmm. so i guess it doesn't stop it just kind of it's a uh kind of his wheelhouse he kind of pull out every now and then you know mm. But let me think. I think this is. I, I'm maybe making a mistake, but I I'm 
pretty certain this is the one that was originally three reels, meaning hmm. this is something closer to 30 minutes or longer. And because they lost the reel, um, that's why they're, it feels disjointed. Out of all of the shorts, this is probably one of the most disjointed. Uh, all the other ones are probably two reelers. Mm-hmm. So they're as complete as possible uh, with obviously bits and pieces missing because just the nature of way things are collected. But this is probably the most uh, egregious in terms of the things that are lost. Yeah, because definitely when they showed the photos too, you know, you get you get a you know a little sampler of what might have happened. Exactly. Because maybe you know, because the way it's kind of cut now, it's definitely like he's at it's the disjointed. bottom of the barrel. Yeah, you know, it's disjointed too. Yeah, so I'm yeah. kind of sad about the missing footage, um, but um, is there anything? That's from here that you were that, like a specific stunts or gags that you were. You felt was oh my really gosh. Strong. Yeah. The tracking shot where that was probably, I counted, I was watching how long it, the running gag. Well, yeah, it was like a running gag. It was almost 40 seconds. Wow. So when he's, uh, yeah, I don't think it cut at all until they were going to the street corner. Right. But, um, yeah, he's just walking down the street in his Roman garb after getting kicked out of the theater. <laughs> and the cops, you know, slowly walking, you know, behind him. And, you know, it's just slowly going by. And then you, it just seemed like every time they passed a certain, like a telephone pole or um, a car, they would pick up their pace just a bit. And then it just kept going and going. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, then they, then Buster Keaton goes into this freaking full out sprint and it was like oh my god that's quite the <laughs> athlete you know yeah i yeah you could see like how i mean we all know he's fit just because of all the stunts he does but it's crazy because they had to follow him in some other car and you know keep pace and then this is where his cameraman has to keep wheeling the the gear the um the handle at the, the same yeah thank you the crank at the same speed just to make sure he gets it all and it didn't break w- one bit for almost 40 seconds and i was like whoa the shot <laughs> well it's that same so guy good. that you noticed before yeah um, elgin something leslie. something yeah thank yeah. you elgin leslie yep so it it it's interesting because y- you start seeing that there are certain artisans behind the camera and not just in front you know that is contributing you know greatly to so many different films you know yeah and he continues to work with buster as well he's worked with so this guy came from um the Arbuckle days work with uh, Harry Langdon, which is another similar to all these silent film comedians. He's less known, but he's just yeah, as Yeah, I know good. Harry Langdon. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. So he's just kind of up there, too. It's just he's not he doesn't get like the same billings as like, you know, the Chaplins, the Keatons, the even Arbuckle. But it, yeah, he's definitely one of the ones very similar to like Lloyd, too. It's the other Harry. <laughs> silent film <laughs> comedian. But yeah, I mean, this uh, cameraman. Uh, has worked with them all and also do a lot of visual effects and he did he did the one in the playhouse too where he duplicated yeah Yeah. so basically how he did that was he would um mask i think you you described that right you would mask the yeah he he masked one part of the camera and then he would have to roll it back very exactly. carefully yep. and then covered i think copy it was just and paste an, yeah like it's a copy ways. and paste <laughs> <laughs> and would uh just shift the shutter over a bit and then f- film buster doing that uh, that skit and then same thing roll it back slowly and then move it o- and adjust it a little more with the framing and then do it all over again yeah, and um, I don't know about this specific short, but there are many, many uh, shorts and features where he continues to do special effects, like throughout the years. Mm. So it's pretty cool. It's not just like one thing; it's just a continuous thing. You know, he would constantly have visual effects, kind of just throughout all of his works. So that's well, pretty cool. Mm. Anyways, I did. I think he ended up. Uh, he ended up uh, not not going into the uh, sound era, I think. So, but anyway. <laughs> you mean the talkie era? Yeah. This is... He stopped around eight, 28 or something. Hmm. Yeah. 
maybe got tired of it. I don't know. He's probably like, okay, I've done it all. I'm good. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Sometimes people just have a change in career. Like, they view this as like, um, yeah, he, he finished filmmaking. What did he say? He's retired from filmmaking after shooting the cameraman with uh, Buster in 1928. Hmm. So, he's, yeah, I, I don't know. I... I don't. I don't know if there is a biography on him, but if there is, it'd be interesting to figure out what happened and all yeah. that stuff. Because I don't know how old he was when he died, so I don't know if it. I mean, it Wait. could be like you said. It could be anything. He could born in eighteen eighty three. <laughs> wow. So yeah, that makes sense. So he 60 died in forty four, sixty one. He was sixty one when he died in forty four. So he was still fairly young when he was doing the Buster Keaton shorts. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe, I don't know. He had a family. But that's the thing about, like, sometimes people have a career in a short stint, like, um, that are, they're a Seeley, uh, Oh, yes. Yeah, Sybil Seely, yeah. Yeah. So, like, so she starred in a, a handful of uh, shorts and was pretty popular, I bet, during that time when they were showing these commercially. But you know what? Like, people just have different career paths, even back then. Yeah. They're just like, if you know whatever is happening here, I'm done with that, and they they do something else. Like they might go in the grocery store. They might do something I, completely. That's different. true. <laughs> it's just like a big career change. It's not like you're stuck in one career like indefinitely, you know. And uh, it happens all the time with these films because because the, there are many, um, especially during Kevin Brownlow era, you know, mm-hmm. you know those books. Well, all those stars are doing some of them are doing something else career wise, and when he tracked them down and started inv- interviewing them, you know what I mean. That's just interesting to see the progression, you know. Very but, interesting. I really like that. Sorry, I just want to say I really like that analogy you just made of like just going to the grocery store. <laughs> I mean, you can just go to any one because I mean, really, it, it's, I don't know. It's kind of like a simple decision in one way for certain people. Yeah, and I also think that um, there are sort of fame and fortune, sort of popularity and sort of the media sort of fame stuff back then but i don't think it's to the same craziness and level that we have today because no it's, way. it's a total saturation even like youtubers want to have fame and fortune and it's just like kind of a big sort of overarching i don't know kind of like an idol or some something that people want to chase after yeah like for so long but then it's like back then they don't necessarily think about it that way. They just think it's like a, a job. They get paid. Yeah, it's a job. And then they'll go into something else. Like, mm. it, you know, if they want to switch, it's totally their decision. You know, it, it, I I don't always think that the people, at, at least in the early days, uh, well, even now probably, but work at it as if it was like, a, you know, for all the fame and fortune, all that stuff. It's just like it's something to pay the bills. And, and then when it doesn't, then you can switch like any career, you know, to something else. So I thought that was interesting. Hmm. Which happens quite frequently, apparently. So, very true. <laughs> anyway, um, what were some of your favorite parts of this film? Um, just those imaginary pieces, like you were talking about. I really wish that they were there. Like, I really wish yeah. that we could see those. Um, I wrote down bucket jump. Um, uh, was crazy bucket jump. You have to remind me. I actually watched this a while th- ago now. And I was like, what, what is the book of jump? Yeah. Uh, what did there, I write down? Mm-hmm. So there's some, there's probably a scene in there where he's jumping buckets or something. Goes from I one didn't bucket write it down. Other. I don't know. Because <laughs> yeah, I wrote I like, the cops hiding in the tram car for the gag. That was cute. And he was in the paddle boat wheel. Yes. Is that the... And then I just liked... I also wrote that I like the cops were literally kissing him off with a good riddance after he like dived <laughs> well it must be it must be some sort of a uh, a crazy stunt that's probably what it was it, it, like uh like for example, sur- yeah sorry for go example, ahead like the the fisherman trying to like uh fish buster out as a fish yeah the end, <laughs> like and he's like a fish we could see that there is a probably a, a line um sort of a contraption where he part of his pants it's like a, it's almost like a whole sort of um, roping system as part of built in as part of his pants, mm-hmm. so that when they have a huge sort of uh, thin line, sort of hooking the him up out of the water, it's probably a crane or something off off screen. Yeah, probably. I mean, you can see that. So some of these gags you could just see, 
it's pretty event evident <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you know like there are many stunts maybe not in this one but like in general where if there, he's on a seesaw type ladder and then somebody mm-hmm. jumps on one end and he flies off and well you could definitely tell there's a crane shot where a crane sort of pulling him because you could see the arch right so he yeah. flies off the ladder but then the crane catches him and he keeps flying <laughs> <laughs> you could see the arch, you know, as in the action as he's flying off the screen. So I feel like there are certain sort of um, elements like that. That's pretty funny. So, but anyway, mm. very cool. Yep, I, I did write down that um, it's fun. It's pretty funny that he couldn't even kill himself. Even that one thing, he's just kind of a disaster. Yeah, a I missed. Disaster. <laughs> and that's where he he got kicked out. Or, or was it this one that he got the bus? Yeah, it was kick? this one that I where the remember. father booted him out the window and it's just like, oh. Yeah, it's the famous bus to kick. <laughs> I can't remember. It's all mixed up once you see these so many times, one after the other. <laughs> I can't remember which yep. which one is going to which. Well, I know. I was gonna say, were you sure the bucket one was in daydreams? Because I'm like, I don't remember anything about buckets. <laughs> I don't know. I have to go. Well, back I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, oh, I think it was. Was it the one where he's cleaning a street and it's going to a bucket? And there's something oh, to do with yeah, that? yeah. Okay, yeah. Now that you say that, yeah, yeah, when he's a type of garbage man, all the dirt just keeps falling out the bottom. It's like, oh boy. But then he did something with it. Did he jump into it or did he did he go all the way through or something? Did or... he jump? He fell into a manhole on top of some guy. That's what it was. He... Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I wrote that down, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's entertaining, but I, I do feel like that third missing reel is is a detriment i think if we got the whole complete thing maybe it would have been a better experience but that's what it felt like for this one yeah i think it would definitely kind of draw out more sense too with why all the cops are chasing him because right, right. <laughs> you know in like one of our previous uh podcasts where you know he's getting chased by all the cops too you know why he's getting chased by right. all of them but for this one it's just kind of like oh there they are <laughs> what do yeah. you do <laughs> Let's move on to the next one, The Electric House. It's a uh, 1922 comedy. He plays a botany student who accidentally uh, switches. They drop the... Um, so they're in a college graduation, and, uh, you know, they're at sort of the ceremony, the graduation ceremony, and somehow they all accidentally drop their degrees, and it's, a, it's called Mixed Up, and then uh, Keaton picks up somebody else's electrical engineering degree for... For botany, he originally graduated with botany degree, but he got switched with a, a double E, what we call double E, mm-hmm. <laughs> electrical engineering. And then uh, there's somebody hiring, which is you know the big Joe, Joe Roberts, who plays him. And um, this person hiring says, you know, I want somebody who's uh, you know electric engineer to come and wire and make my home a smart home. Essentially, they didn't use that mm. word, but that's essentially what it, what he wanted for his home. Smart gadgets. <laughs> mm-hmm. Back in 1922, right? Yeah. And he'll give them an award and stuff like that and sell patents and make money and all that stuff. So that's pretty forward thinking if you think about it. I mean, they had electricity and they had homes and houses. But just so many of the elements of what this house could be back pre-computer days. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's very ingenious because i i actually yeah. forgot to look up when escalators were invented but I, apparently it was by 1922 <laughs> yeah. maybe i don't know i don't know when it was invented but anyway it's the plot and um i i the first thing I, I found funny was that the degree whatever you physically have in your hand is the degree you graduated like there's no way to change that <laughs> yeah Basically, you cannot like go back to your college and be like, "Hey, can I just get another copy?" It's like when you physically pick up your uh, graduation set diploma or whatever you call it, mm-hmm. that's it. That's your that's the career you're stuck with. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe back then. <laughs> Thank that's goodness hilarious. it's not that way now. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be in, a lot of us would be in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that was kind of pretty funny um just the the degree um the you know when it gets into the house 
I mean, I was thinking to myself, of course it has to be a house, be, just because, not just to get a title, but because, you know, uh, Buster loves all that engineering stuff. I mean, he just mm-hmm. loves it, right? So, of course, this house is about another, I mean, this short is about another house that has a mind of its own, gone crazy, right? Of course. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's a little plot detail in there, too, is that, um, so when the person that he got switched with, the, the, the diploma, he originally has the double E, but he got the botany degree. Well, he exacts revenge on him by screwing with the electrical wiring for this electric house he's trying to invent and, and fi- figure out and fix. And uh, that's where the house goes haywire. Yeah, that's that's the plot thread. <laughs> but yeah, of course, it has to be these, these uh, uh, smart gadget homes. And the thing that I found funny was that the the plot is that you know big joe character he has the home and he was basically saying whoever i'm hiring i want him to you know electric engineer to outfit this house with the best of the best and the guy who has the botany buster keaton's character he has the botany to go of course he can figure it out right it's the same thing mm-hmm. botany and electric <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out to be pretty cool it, it, you know when you know the the big joe character went on a trip came home and everything was outfitted already and um I just thought that was it, – it's a really cool thing to see all of the gadgets demonstrated, you know? Yeah, the house. I really like that too. I mean, you were just waiting, of course, until everything goes crazy. You just – you knew that was going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. The nature of the – I was just the, like, the, I don't know. Yeah, you see everything of like, oh, geez, what's – what's <laughs> how is everything going to get – you know, I figured explosion or something. Exactly. But what's what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, so, so that's kind of my – I think about this now the the I thought there was one particular thing that was really interesting, which was i there was a scene in there in this short where the lights got turned off and on when the lights are on it's gold tint at least the copy I saw hmm. and then when the lights got turned off, it's blue right like oh interesting yeah, I don't know which co- if you saw uh, just a black and white copy, but the one I saw is is with the tint. This I felt like this is one of the very very few times that I felt like the well not few uh, some of the times rather that I felt like it was a very uh, genius use of just the coloring and tinting of of a mm. film back in that era. So like when you're in the house, everything is gold and 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 yellow tint because the lights are on, right? Electrical. Right. When you turn it off, it's blue and dark. <laughs> Nighttime, mm. nightshade blue, you know. Yeah, I like that idea because, like, obviously, I didn't see that type of version either. But I do yeah. like that it was tinted. That's that the way. Kino copy. So I bet you the Can- Canopy probably has it. So anyway, so I thought it was a very uh, uh, generally funny and interesting technical use of that uh, tinting moment, as it applies to the elements of the story. We've seen that before too, in terms of lighting on and off. But this one in particular was was pretty funny when they actually utilize that for laughs gags hmm. anything else that stand out for you in this one um well i don't know is this a good time to mention the article i found on electric sure, go ahead. yeah yeah so i when i was doing research on a couple of these films because i'm always trying to learn a little bit more about them like where they were filmed what you know what was i think going it is on. the same house isn't it yeah, I yeah. Di- we've definitely seen parts of this house in other yeah. films. I think it was like in the haunted house, and I believe it was in one more, at least with a staircase. I don't know which, because they're all blending together now. Right. But uh, someone wrote an article comparing the electric house to the haunted house, the one prior, and it was kind of inter- it was very interesting. It's written by a man named Walter Biggins, and he's a writer based in Atlanta, Georgia. And he's got a WordPress, too, that's called Quiet Bubble. And he talks about arts, culture, and poppycock. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'll link in the show notes. Yeah, we'll link it. Because I, I, I'm i going to kind of summarize it. But it was – it's short enough, but it's still interesting. Because um, he was saying with the haunted house compared to this, it was sort of a trial run to the electric house just because – uh, with the haunted house things just kind of happened like you were there but you didn't really know why you were there besides that that's where the bad guys were but it kind of was like it came out of the blue i think because it wasn't set up properly but with 
he, um, the way the electric house is kind of set up, you ha- you're at the house from the very beginning, so it's kind of a character in itself, which we usually compare that to with the Buster Keaton films. And uh, because of the way it's designed in... Oh, I'm trying to think what else he wrote. Uh, you can cut part of this out. Oh, no, we're leaving everything in. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm trying to read and think at the same time. <laughs> no, worries. take your time. By the way, I found the escalator uh, was uh, 1859. It was a, oh, wow. Pa- it, was, it was patented, the, the name escalator, um, by Nathan Ames, who is a patent attorney from Saugus, Mass. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Crazy, right? That's too, that's too real. <laughs> yeah, not invented yet, but the whole sort of concept and idea. It wasn't until um, there's no models built, so they're just testing things out still. Even by 1889, another guy, Lehman Selder, and then it was ultimately about 1892 that they started to physically build it out, I think. So sometime after 1892 is when all this stuff started to co- go live. Holy cow. Isn't I would that crazy? Never ex- yeah, I would have never yeah. expected it was before the 1900s. Yeah, I think so. Like, we all typically think of all the modern tech as more recent than they are but in re- re- yeah. reality like even you know the still photography and moving pictures i mean you know early 1800s they were experimenting mm-hmm. with so many sort of technical stuff but anyways a lot of people don't think it's about true. that you know when you start thinking yeah. about that's really the industrial age that really changed the whole era of time of 1800 1900s that those two 200 years were incredible incredible sort of growth in technology just all sorts of technology you know not just computer but just like stuff all even all the stuff before computers you know wow yeah and a uh, cool oh my gosh um okay i'm just gonna read this because i can't like summarize it <laughs> okay. so walter's basically comparing the two films and he said i found electric funnier than haunted and watching the two back to back helped me understand why um he's i mentioned this a little bit before too but in some ways, Haunted seems like a test run for Electric. In the form of film, we know from the beginning that the quote-unquote haunted house is really jerry-rigged by the criminals using the place as a hideout. Um, it's key that we don't know exactly how it's booby-trapped until Buster enters, but in the short second half, half, and you know it just keeps surprising us, and Buster's kept off guard by each gag. But uh, he was just saying that Haunted kind of threw him off balance and he seemed like there was no foundation for the comedy in its narrative. He thought it was the plot was rickety and the mo- motives were ill-configured until the camera started rolling. He said it has like a ramshackle energy because of its instability and it makes the movie feel surreal instead of ordered. And then it kind of he kind of based it on dream logic. That's like his phrasing for it. And it just kind of barely gets by that way because of the smoke and mirrors obscuring its shaky structure. So I kind of thought that was interesting. And then he mentions how the electric house is sounder. You know, through the mix-up, Buster got tired by a millionaire, Big Joe, to make his mansion into a fully automated home while the wealthy mansion, uh, wait, while he's away on extended vacation. And then he's just like, Buster's only armed with his botanist degree and what is essentially electrician for dummies. <laughs> but um, then what else? You know, they said his innervations are really incredible. And even though they're bonkers, they're really cool and practical. So he's just kind of continuing about, like, why why Electric House is better and why Haunted House wasn't so much. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, one's sort of predecessor. You know, sets up mm-hmm. the other one. So that's pretty cool. I do like some of the animated GIF that he kind of captured, which is yellow, by the way. Notice the gold. Yeah. Tank. But um, anyway, so the, like the dishwashing machine is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But also like the the pool hall, the pool table sort of re-racking ball. That's still pretty cool yeah, even th- today. Yeah, that's neat. Like I wish that was, I mean, I don't play a lot of pool, but if I did, I wish I had a machine <laughs> like that. That would just re-rack, I mean, all the time, right? Yeah, 
I thought the little train was cute for dinner. But, I mean, oh, yeah. that's not really practical. It's just no. fun for the movie. But the pool one, you know, draining your pool, I mean, maybe not so much with the whole crank. <laughs> oh, yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. still, you know, you know, it takes a while for a pool to drain. But still, it'd be kind of neat if it was like that. Just like, yeah. okay, ready for summer. Pool! <laughs> I do love how the Big Joe character went up the escalator and then went through the window yeah. into the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Just, the window just himself. has to be there, right? There's no <laughs> wall there. There has to be a window there for the gags. So, <laughs> but yeah, overall it's good. I uh, not the strongest, I think, but uh, definitely another one of those house shorts. I call it for Buster because he often yeah. just loves doing set pieces like this, and he's really, you know, this is an area he excels in. You know, making homes that. Basically, as a character unto, unto itself when it comes alive, right? Yeah, so. I agree. Actually, this is the short where he broke his ankle doing the elevator thing or escalator, rather. Oh, wow. And when he, yeah, he does get injured. And when it happens, while he's uh, recuperating and he came up with the idea of the playhouse, and that's where he went back and started. To, and if you notice in the playhouse, he's basically sitting still, not doing too much. Um, hmm. stunts in the beginning right it's kind of a technical feat right that first half so it's that that uh, multiple clones of buster and playhouse that's that mm -hmm. was done like you know as a result of this so it's interesting how even his workarounds for work like was still pretty amazing you know yeah so did they say uh what he exactly broke his ankle on during the filming i think the escalator thing the steps when they're Ooh. going up. Mm hmm Yeah. Jeez. Anywho, moving on. Next one's called the Balloonatic and um Balloonatic. Balloonatic. I don't can't even remember pronouncing it. <laughs> but that's why you're here, right? <laughs> I, I mean that's how I read it. I was like, oh it makes sense. Well, you're He's probably crazy. correct. So <laughs> the the plot is um Bustick's character has a series of encounters in the amusement area and it's like Coney Island until um, a group of men prepare hot air balloon for launching and then Buster climbs on top of the air balloon and then takes off by mistake with the young man on top. So, and basically kind of, uh, you know, lands, lands the balloon in the wilderness area and he encounters an outdoors woman and proceeds of a series of adventures. So that's kind of high level of the plot. Yeah, I liked Balloonatic a lot. Maybe it was because uh, he couldn't really keep up with the frontier woman, <laughs> and she was doing it all on her own. Yeah, but it was pretty I thought cool. she held up her end of the her sort of screen presence is really cool. Her name is uh, Phyllis Haver. Mm -hmm. and I thought she did a, a pretty good job keeping up with um, the the character. Like, I mean, keeping up with Buster. Very few people yeah. can kind of hold the same screen. I think, uh, sorry, screen, screen presence uh, as, as he was. So I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because now when you mentioned that too, she did definitely, I don't know if it was just maybe the type of character she was supposed to be commanding, but she felt equal with him in a sense, maybe because she was supposed to be like rough and tough and he was kind of yeah. like, I suck. <laughs> yeah, no, I suck at doing cool. this. <laughs> so yeah, I, I really enjoyed that, so. Yeah, so with uh, this, you know, this one, I was just, and I, I'm like, the stunts, once again, you know, Buster's crazy, and I love it, and, you know, I'm, I was just, I had wrote, you know, I'm glad this is in black and white, because I hoped the hot air balloon was only a few feet off the ground, because if he was in the air, I would have cried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because with the basket broken, I was like, oh my god. Well, I'm sure it's all, you know, he's not, I, I know he looks like he takes a lot of risk but he actually does things pretty safe i would hope so because <laughs> I, so. I don't know i'm just thinking back in the day before all the safety hazards i'm like i don't know is he up 20 feet in the air is he up 100 feet in the air well, who's right. to say <laughs> i i don't i think it was a, his film now it's all mixed in because i i watched ahead but I, in at least one of the films i want to say sherlock jr <laughs> maybe not that one I can't remember which one, but there was one particular shot where he's um, in the car and he's 
driving forward and he's narrowly missing a train. A train just sort of whooshes by, Ooh. misses him. Um, he didn't do that like as the film is showing. He did, he did that backwards, just like those other shots that we, we've seen before where the right. train stops so suddenly in front of the camera. It's a backward shot. So again, he had to act backwards. So when that, mm. when, when you rewind that, you re sort of you play it backwards. It it's the right sort of sequence. So it looks like he was, um, you know, he narrowly the train narrowly missed his car. When in reality, he is actually, you know, his driver's going backwards. And then when they, you know, they filmed it backwards as it were. And then when they played it forward, in the right sort of speed, or and they may even sped it up a little bit just to give you a. Uh, a sort of tense you know, context or scene and when that happened that's what happened like y- you f- you felt like you the train almost hit him in the car right mm-hmm. that's what i mean by so those visual effects so what was i saying oh the purpose of me saying that is because he still plays it safe so he's not like totally bonkers like you know crazy he's still like is able to make those stunts pretty safe you know that's good yeah he knows how to do it <laughs> It's a whole, it's a whole engineering thing, you know. So. Mm, that makes sense. I mean, when you're an engineer too, you have to be innovative right. and you know just think outside the box. So, uh, you know, why <laughs> why not try to prevent yourself from imminent death? <laughs> yeah. Let's think of all the ways. <laughs> yep. So she, the uh, Phyllis Haver actress, was um, born in Kansas and uh, won some beauty sort of pageants or whatever, and then. And got discovered that way for a two wheeler in for Senate Studios. Senate Studios is a really popular. Mark Senate Studios, really popular silent film comedy producer. Um, Ch- Charlie Chaplin, for example, hmm. came out of his uh, Biograph and also later opened Keystone. So there's multiple companies. Biograph was his New York company. Keystone was his California company. Hmm. Um, and the reason why, because you know Edison was trying to crack down on all films. Oh, Imagine yeah. all films paying royalty to Edison. So when that happened, a lot of people <laughs> moved to California. So a lot of careers kind of did that. But anyway, so he is one of the pro- sort of originators of, you know, cops chasing people <laughs> or car <laughs> chases, spy throwing, all those things, slapstick. So that's kind of his thing. But anyways, so he kind of t- helped discover this Phyllis here, um actress. And then she would go on to, um, in a few years, she she was kind of guest sort of um, star, but this movie, The Balloon Egg, is the one that really sort of uh, opened her career up. You know, mm. after she was cast as this one, and because you know, like Buster and would definitely know Senate and all those people. Like in terms of just you know professional relationships, you know, be like, hey, you know, somebody can afford. You know, I mean, uh, help star in this, and they'd kind of look around and help cast people. They don't really have casting directors kind of the way we do today. They kind of just yeah. ask around and stuff like that. So later on, she would sign up with um, other companies like uh, DeMille, Pathé, and played Roxy Hart in uh, Chicago, 1927. Hmm, so cool. She would do stuff like that. And then she would do more comedies later on um, with D.W. Griffith and Lon Chaney. Um, in his last f- silent film uh, called Thunder in 1929 and on and on. So, yeah, she's got a career uh, in silent films, 1917 all the way through 1930. So Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's her in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, but I would say that, um, yeah, that was the biggest note, I would say, uh, is that, you know, Buster's up to his usual stick, which is like, he often has bears as a gag just because yeah i've noticed that for a few of them (laughs) (laughs) Uh, they're different yeah and other dangerous animals i guess but the bear is the big one it seems to be oh here's the bear and he's be nonchalant Mm -hmm. until they get discovered and it is very bear right there and then um but there are many creative sets again many many set pieces like the canoe you know going over the waterfall and being hooked up to the balloon so they didn't like fall to their death yeah <laughs> a lot of fishing sort of outdoors equipment any a number of those things are just any of those gags are pretty funny but i do have to say that i think the primary thing about this short is that the phyllis uh haver actress is 
really held her own. I, I think that was the kind of the showcase of her sort of uh, chemistry with Buster. And I think that's mm. the big, big takeaway from the short. That was, I, d- I don't even think that any of the other ones have sort of this chemistry. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, Celia, ha- that uh, other actress is, has a different energy for sure. Yeah. It's, you can tell that they're more kind of, they're better for being loving with yeah, each other. The romantic well, comedy type. Ideas, yeah. Romantic. But- but this one is more just uh, sort of the funny gags are they're they're pretty good with doing that. So, any other thoughts about this one? Um, so for some of these shots too, I was this is when I was looking up uh, where some of this you know some of this film was filmed, <laughs> duh, and I actually found another. It wasn't exactly an article, but I found a website about the backlots for Buster Keaton Studios, which I thought was super interesting. And it said, uh, along with a, a lot of them, like the goat, the scarecrow, etc. cetera, um, part of a lunatic was filmed on this lot. And they were, they had a still from the reaction shot of the mini crowd that was, you know, they were waiting for the hot air balloon to go in the air. And in this giant, if you blow up the photo behind the small crowd, you can see a studio sign, you know, facing away from the camera and on it would say Buster Keaton Studios. So it's hard to see it if you're watching the film, but until you have it pointed out to you, it was kind of, I don't know, it was just kind of like a little factoid. So whatever, it's like still from where we get a reaction shot of the small crowd after the man failed to lift up in the basket shows the studio sign from yeah. behind. You're probably thinking of John Bengston's book called Silent Echoes, discovering early Hollywood through the films of Buster Keaton. And this yeah, guy, I did see that title. Well, he did all of those research. So he, what he he likes to do is uh, he likes to kind of um, uh, take a either a star or a series of films or whatever and then he would go and research their films and compare it and contrast against the city plans of the past so you go to this town hall or city hall grab those plans and because so many buildings are like gone right yeah and so and the reason i know this is because i have the um the blu-ray or dvd and on the dvd there are like bonus features hmm. and the bonus features are of this guy basically narrating and showing you in clips and pictures, some of which is probably on YouTube. You can probably Google or uh, search on YouTube on the guy's name, John uh, Bengston, uh, B-E-N-G-S-T-O-N. And he would demonstrate you to you that, you know, using stills from these shorter features, where in the sort of um, um, studio lot that they're shooting this. There'd be Very a block. There'd be like a block. They're like right next to uh, Lauren Hardy, basically. W- they were, yeah. Who were making stuff, and his, and his studio, Keaton Studio, is actually Chaplin's old studio when he was making shorts. Because by 1920 something, 21, Chaplin had already graduated to feature films. He already made the kid, so he's gone on. He he's basically done with shorts at that point. When Buster sort of started his, so he took over uh, Chaplin's old stomping grounds <laughs> <laughs> just found that pretty funny they were like in each other's lives a lot i just again i've said this before i just really wish that they made a movie together in that era in their prime as it were yeah they only appeared later on um in a uh, uh talkie but their scene together was very brief and they basically did a short a silent short uh gag back then but Again, I wish they kind of did work with each other. That'd be kind of cool to see sort of the two greatest, one of the two greatest, you know. Yeah, I wonder, I'm trying to think, maybe there, I don't know. I feel like there would have been some type of record that mentioned it if there was a silent film that had just been lost that featured both of them. But That'd be cool. Yeah. I'm not aware of any, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it would have been written down somewhere unless they just find it in some random ledger. Oh, this happened. Oh, okay. That'd be amazing if they had like a silent film uh, cinematic universe <laughs> where 
all oh of gosh, the greatest yeah. <laughs> ones, Harold Lloyd, Langdon, and whoever, throw them in there, Buckle, and they all kind of did their own gags. That'd be really cool, now that I'm thinking of it. Because you'd get, like, the greatest of the greatest, you know? Mm. And, and they kind of all sort of throw all of their talents into a single short or, f- or film. That'd be kind of cool. Alas, that never happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. Kinda. now that you brought that up, have you seen the film, uh, the Laurel and Hardy film that they did, or no? Yeah, it's with Stan um, and Ollie with John C. Riley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen it, but I I heard about it. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask your opinion on it because it. I don't know. That'd be actually kind of good to watch. Now I have something else to watch. <laughs> sure. We could probably just to see if how you know how accurate they went. I mean, I think they did, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we'd have to watch Lauren Holly first, and then. <laughs> <laughs> and then kind of work work the way through, the, through there, right? So true. But anyways, the re- reason I mentioned that book is what you just mentioned, which is that he's done the primary research. He figured yeah. out like where in the buildings, in the in the shooting locations, these things are shot at, and it's so interesting. Basically, he shot all the way around the lot. There are very few mm-hmm. films, just like the Frozen North, where he would travel for a little further. But other than that, it just it's fun. It's like he just would do everything all in the same lot in the same like couple blocks you know so i thought that was pretty cool Hmm. anyway um any other thoughts about this short um i liked the other intertitle card now this is where we go back to the wit too after the this bear escape a backwards romance begins (laughs) because they were running away from the bears once again for the gag. That was just another cute little enter title card where we, you know, talking about how witty he is with his writing. Cause I'm sure he wrote it. (laughs) Yeah. Did this short, by the way, have like, um, really delicate graphic intertitles? I can't remember. Did Did this one? Um, there were a few shorts that had that by the way. Yeah. I don't know about this one in particular. It's, it seemed kind of standard to me. Yeah, so so what I found, I mean, again, I, all of this is behind the scenes stuff on the DVD stuff, but there, remember that um, San Francisco silent one, every um, yeah, men's problem, women's problem, I forgot what it is. Yeah, uh, Me- Mothers of Men, and then yeah, it's every one. woman's problem or something like that. The intertitle graphics are amazing, right? So apparently that's a thing. Like back then, including Buster's films, they had like really well done graphic intertitles that's pretty common apparently <laughs> and the reason you don't see them nowadays is because it's lost so they had to rebuild it so right. they either rebuilt it back um a few decades after the sentence and they found these footage and kind of sort of uh put something in their intertitles or uh they had to do something modern now you know which is you know it's just basically bl- black black background with white text but those mm-hmm. intricate intertitles apparently you know like super well drawn and detailed and a lot of graphics drawn on apparently it's that was a thing so a lot of them did have that the the, the more you know higher budget productions didn't know that but um mm. so just fyi i guess yeah um any other thoughts about this one before we go to the the final short no um but besides it was my that was my favorite out of all four uh no i don't have any other notes i just like that uh when he went into the tunnel of love the lady beat him up (laughs) that was the other like (laughs) cute note like trying to woo some other lady for his film and then she's like nope (laughs) but that's but that's it the final one is called the love nest 1923 be this final one uh before he moves on to uh his feature debut which was, um, let me see what was called here. It was, well, he starred in these, but he didn't really direct these. Um, which is the one that he, oh, he starred in one. He starred in one in 1920 already when he was making his shorts called The Saphead, but he didn't really uh, direct it. Uh, he directed his first one, it's called uh, Three Ages, uh, after the shorts were done. Uh, in 1923 
but this love nest was done in March of 1923, and then he'd work on the Three Ages uh, and then release in the fall, September of 1923. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, this is this final short called Love Nest, um, 1923, and it's not a film comedy, and, and, and basically it's about uh, in order to escape from his life and his lost love, Keaton sets off on a small boat Cupid but runs into the whaling ship. The love nest, the whaler's merciless captain, Joe Roberts, throws crew members overboard for even the slightest offense. After a steward accidentally pours hot tea all over the captain's hand, the captain tosses him overboard and replaces him with Keaton. Despite a series of mishap, Keaton manages to avoid the fate of other crewmen. <laughs> and um, you got Big Joe here as the captain, and also Virginia Fox as the girl in Buster Green. What are your thoughts about this one? I like that he uses tears to seal the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> Very um, melodramatic, I guess. <laughs> yeah, super melodramatic. <laughs> um, I I I liked, I liked it. I don't know. I didn't write anything impressive for my notes as compared to like the Electric House and Balloonatic. Um. Just the same thing that the captain just throws his men overboard for minor offenses. There's, I mean, besides all the gags, which are super funny, men keep going overboard. He and then he just has their funeral funeral wreath ready to whip over. <laughs> that was pretty good. I think part of the reason why it's difficult to kind of have these shorts make an impact is because of the dream. Like at this, the at the very end, we find out. So the plot, the more detailed plot, is that because of his, uh, you know girl problem whatever and also his life problems he wanted to kind of sh uh, run away from it all by going on a boat yeah. and just kind of sail away well that's the plot but he ended up just you know he, all of his adventures about this other captain business it's all like a dream and at the end he wakes up just like many other shorts like mm -hmm. he's been doing and it's like uh, when you have a dream sequence when stuff happens it's like it, there's nothing there's no risk right everything yeah that was in the in the dream world wasn't real right so that's why you like at least for me it's hard to have like this short have an impact when it was all a dream like for example one week was great to me because it was about the couple being married and they had to build a house together but it was like a real thing it wasn't like at the end it was just like a dream you know yeah and the other ones are like maybe even like the haunted house where you know, he had a dream, but it was short because it was just like heaven and hell. Like, that's a very short sequence. It wasn't like the whole story was a dream, right? Mm -hmm. But then you had this one where it's like, you know, you had the beginning part, which was real. But then you had the end part, which is real. He woke up from the dream. But all the stuff in between, when he left the dock, he never left the dock. It was all a dream. <laughs> but of yeah. course, of course, that's probably the joke is life is but a dream, right? Row, row, row your boat. Mm -hmm. But the point is, it's like, you know, you. It it doesn't it just means that he didn't have stake like it wasn't there wasn't a risk it was just like yeah you know it, it was just kind of another story happen, you know in a strange way I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot real hard on this but it's sort of like Avengers Endgame <laughs> oh boy <laughs> that's real hard pivot right there right there <laughs> Super because hard pivot. you know if you have time travel like nothing matters in the movie you know what I mean. Like anybody, mm -hmm. any, any and all of the characters could die and come back. It's just like, ah, oh, whatever. Because the stakes don't matter if you have the ability to make it all a dream. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's probably unrelated. But <laughs> 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 making a real hard pivot there. <laughs> I, I mean, one thing I noticed with this uh, film, I thought he was a very more expressive at least with his eye rolls and just kind of i don't know i felt like he was a little more playful against joe roberts this time because it was kind of everything he did he knew he was in big trouble so he's like oh, oh well <laughs> i don't know i it, you know, he's never really that expressive but i just thought he was more expressive with his eyes this time yeah i don't know i think the um the arbuckle shorts he's way more expressive um because he didn't he didn't know if you could he could have done the same deadpan on the stage that he could bring it over into to films so mm -hmm. we we haven't seen those so we don't know but in time he's kind of then settled back into his deadpan 
like that's the thing yeah. that really makes his his money his money shots as it were but i do think that the early days if you ever watch the the some of the shorts i haven't seen them all but i've seen a a, a handful of them and he he does sort of experiment with how to act you know in the early days yeah that makes sense and so and, and i think in time even this i think there are pieces of it he's experimenting more but anyways that's probably exp- but but of course it was a dream right <laughs> All a dream. That's the thing. It's like nothing matters. So he could do anything he wants, right? So. No, he never left the dock. Yep. He grew a beard. Who yeah. knows? Who cares? You know, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the thing about these plots where it's like that. It's like it, it's not as impactful, you know? Yeah. Definitely right. Because, yeah, it just it was just another film to me. Nothing... I don't know. It's just, yeah, another part of the collection where you're like, yeah, you know, give him some golf claps, whatever. But that's the end that comes to the, unless you have anything else to say about Loveness, we can wrap up. I mean, besides the irony of the name, I didn't, you know, I didn't expect it to be about a boat and there weren't any sea shanties, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, I don't have anything else to offer for it. Oh, the last thing I wrote down, I guess, was that he... Um, he couldn't figure out how to lower his boat. He also, the plot is that he, his boat got captured by the the Big Joe's uh, ship, I think. And they mm-hmm. brought his boat aboard the ship. But in order to leave everything, he couldn't just... I guess he couldn't figure out how to plop the boat down and back into the ocean. So he went down lower decks and you know poked some holes through the ship. He basically lowered the ship so that his boat can float. <laughs> Yo, he threw an axe into the side of a or, boat. I mean, that's what he I didn't poke any yeah. holes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. So he basically made made sure the ship sunk so he could use his boat. <laughs> mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of brilliant. Um, <laughs> yeah. So wrapping up, um, this is the conclusion of this, uh, you know, Buster Keaton shorts that he directed 1920s through um, 23. Um, like I said, prior to his uh, uh, directing feature in Three Ages. And um, let me see how many, I don't know, it's like 19 or something, something like that. What do you, mm. uh, what do you think of overall, if we had this sort of the last final say on these series of shorts, what do you think of the quality of them overall? Um, Worth watching 100%. Um, learning about what Buster Keaton does and who he was and all the skills he had to be able to do, you know, these films is just, it, it's really, you know, it draws you in. I mean, it's the slapstick, the comedy, the seriousness, you know, the, the vaudevillian, you know, know-how. It really just brings you into that era of what the beginning of film was. And I, I don't know, I just recommend watching them because I didn't really know much about Buster Keaton. I mean, just coming from, you know, my own background when it, old film stuff, Charlie Chaplin's at the top of my list. He's the one I've heard most of. I mean, I've heard of Laurel and Hardy and I've kind of heard Buster Keaton's name. I'm guessing. I don't know now since we, since we've been doing the podcast, but they were really the only silent film actors I knew. But I couldn't tell you what they exactly did besides Charlie Chaplin and maybe Laurel and Hardy being funny guys. But there's more to there's more to Buster Keaton than just being funny. You know, it's how he uses how he used the camera and made his films, how he was able to adapt to everything that was happening. Um, but it's a it's a unique collection and yeah. That's all I got. He did direct too. I just looked. I just looked. Sort of scroll back a little bit. He directed. Uh, he co-directed with uh, Art Buckle, Roscoe Art Buckle, in um, 1917 called The Rough House. Hmm. He he wrote and directed with that one too. So that's pretty cool. That he already sort of had his sights set on this way in the beginning of the day. So he he nice. di- directed and wrote uh, 19 shorts that he himself did 1920 to 1923, but Prior to that, he did two, four, six, eight, ten. Oh, lost my two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. Yeah, about roughly about fourteen shorts 
what you did with uh, Arpuckle. Hmm. So maybe one of these days we'll go back to that. Or we can do the solo projects on those. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's um, that kind of concludes our um, podcast on the Buster shorts uh, that he did. I will say that you having seen and watched the head, the Sherlock Jr. in Three Ages, he does continue to evolve. I, I mean... I, it's been you know more than a couple decades since I've seen this stuff, but I I forgot that as good as these shorts are, some of these films are even better, especially Three Ages. I hmm. for, like I just totally forgot. And I was like, in in some ways he's really good with you know shorts, and but in some ways these features are kind of shorts because like um, both are less than an hour long, so they're not quite like eighty ninety minutes like a typical i guess feature length that we know today yeah but for the time back then that was kind of the feature length you know what it could be whatever it is you know from 45 minutes an hour plus right so i found that fascinating that even Mm. the 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 features he would continue to evolve and sort of gain um i i know just uh he would continue to sort of evolve his skill you know so, which I didn't think he would, but he 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 does continue to grow his skill that way. So, anywho, so, uh, but yeah, in terms of this series of collection, um, I don't remember if I've seen the whole thing through, and maybe I've seen most of it. And I just don't remember most of it. Who knows? But it, it like you said, it's good to see his progression. It's so really good to see how he was able to um, kind of work out all of his technical skills that he learned from Arbuckle and applied mm. it to his own work. I mean, he was kind of a hard, hired hand and a gag man for the Arbuckle shorts, but they weren't really his, right? Mm-hmm. But somehow they... Um, in fact, um, one of the behind the scenes on the disc said that Arbuckle went to bat for him. Basically... Uh, promoted him um through various studio heads and it's like you gotta hire this guy this guy's unbelievable he'll make movies better than i have been making and that's how he basically got his job you know at, as wow at the buster keaton studio and that's why he was great for her for him even after his you know issues and he continued to hire and sort of have him you know pay bills and stuff you know so he, he continued to make a living uh, even though it's not like explicitly him yeah but I think even the media knew about it afterwards too. So, anyways, so you know, Buster owed a lot to um, Arpuggle as part of the training grounds and mentorship. You know, in the, in fact, a lot of his gags come from Arpuggle stuff. A lot of Arpuggle stuff was dream sequence. C. there are a lot of dream sequence type stuff in there, and there are a lot of similarities, especially with dogs and stuff. To, like, there's just so many different things, the elements of his shorts that came from Arpuggle. So, but as a standalone work, um, th- there were, you know, really good ones in there. Um, I still like overall, if I had to pick one, one week is still my favorite. Um, I I don't know. There's something about that one. It's just so like, it's so, it encapsulates him to a T, you know, the house spinning, mm-hmm. the sort of, you know, sort of um, absent-minded professor type I- idea where, you know, he thought he did something good, but it's like, it's a screwed up house. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, like the house is a character, you know, was spinning and was kind of turning against everyone. And so, I don't know, I still really like that one. Even after seeing all these other ones, which were really good too. Um, and also like sort of the him and Seeley's sort of um, trilogy of the one week. And then I think it was Scarecrow. Yeah. And and then it was the boat. Or the, or the other way around. Maybe it was Scarecrow one week and then the boat where, you know, Scarecrow they meet sort of um in the courtship phase and then one week they get married and then the the boat is they have kids and then they end up somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, overall these shorts are really good. Um it's kinda good refresher before we kinda tackle all features not all the features we're going to tackle some of the features 
and uh, see where he goes in the future. Um, all right. Any final parting thoughts? Um, I, now that you were mentioning, I'm looking at my list of, I had screenshotted all the films we watched. You know, I, I don't know what my favorite Buster Keaton film was out of this big list that we went through. 19. Yeah, all yeah. 19. Um, I would have to think about it and hopefully answer <laughs> during the next podcast. Cause uh, <laughs> right. if I see screen grabs, then it'll kind of jolt me to think of what I enjoyed about the certain film. But right now, just looking at the names, I'm like, oh, <laughs> like I don't know. By the way, this is a callback to. So we're done with this part. I just I'm just remembering something just now as you're you're saying something. Um, you remember a while back when we we're looking at the San Francisco silent film, which is they posted that movie online. Um, Every yeah. woman's problem was it. Mm-hmm. Remember, you're going to write to them and see if um, uh, whether or not the intertitles were done afterwards or during or something. I if you remember think, that. I think so. I didn't know if you got a response from them, if you wrote them something to ask them a question. Um, I never got a response so far. But you did write them. It's... Okay. I, that, that's all I wanted to check in on. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if COVID has something to do. Usually people, maybe, I mean, I'll, I don't mind sending another email just because maybe it could have gotten lost because that occasionally happens. I've also been having issues with my emails that they just, I'll send it and then it'll disappear. I'm like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> and then I don't realize it until I get a response back saying, there was nothing in this letter. What did you say? So. Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, publishing all of our podcasts and I noticed that there are certain things like that that we had to kind of circle back and follow up on. <laughs> there were probably things that we, we forgot. So if you do think that we forgot something, please email us at uh, watching silent films at gmail.com. That's watching silent films, plural. And what was you going to say following up? You were going to say something. Maybe I, I maybe don't remember. <laughs> okay. Well, you can find more of our stuff at watching silent films. Wordpress.com. And again, that's watching silent films, plural dot wordpress.com. And uh, thank you. And uh, if you're able to, please uh, leave some responses and feedback to the Apple podcast or whichever podcast platform you're listening to us from. And thank you again, listeners. And thank you, Lily. Thank you. We'll We'll talk to you next time.